who was uh, 23 years old, walking the streets of uh, New York at Book Expo America with um, my friend, mentor, Roy H. Williams, co-author on the board. And he said to me, the winners and losers in life are determined where the teams are picked. There are two teams that are essential for your success. The first are the people who pick you to be on their team, and the second are who you pick to be on your team. I've been very fortunate in my life to have been picked by some of the top um, minds in the world to be part of their team, uh, especially Roy uh, Williams and Ray Bard, uh, or certainly publishing. Uh, certainly David uh, selected me along the way, and uh, in the last couple of years, so has uh, my new friend, uh, Flynn McLaughlin. In the world of uh, understanding the internet, understanding conversion, understanding what works and why it works, there are three big names. One is Jacob Nielsen, the next is Brian and Jeffrey Eisenberg, but the biggest of which is Dr. Flynn McLaughlin. He owns a research company out of Florida. They have more data and research on the internet than anyone else, and I would even harbor a guess that probably more than anyone else combined. They have done more, it is a research lab. He does not own, he wanted me to be very clear, he does not own a marketing company, he owns a research lab. And Flynn is asked to speak at universities and businesses all over the world, including, uh, he has a, a good relationship with Oxford. There's no one else that I would listen to when it comes to understanding how the internet works, why people do what they do, and what that means for you and your business than Dr. McLaughlin. Um, you know, he's, he's got a good relationship with the Pope as well. He's one miracle away from uh, getting his, uh, his sainthood, so he's just looking for one more miracle. I to told him that. I told him to use that in the introduction. You sure did. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we're, we all have an opportunity to add people to our team, and I would highly recommend that you take voracious notes you pay close attention to what Flint says because I promise you that he will blow your mind. Dr. Lockett. All right, good afternoon. You've, uh, you've been here all day long, many of you. And uh, I know when a new speaker steps in the platform, you have no idea what's getting ready to happen next. But I sort of want to give you some background. And before I do, I just want to share with you an email that came in last night as I was thinking about speaking today. On the surface, it's a bit boring. It's got some math in it. It has V1 conversion rates at 3.0 and V2 conversion rates at 4.9. And, and when you look at that, you might say to yourself, so what is the point of this and how does that have any impact? Well, you can see it comes from a, an excited analytics expert inside of one of the world's largest companies. And he says great news. Behind this is a story, and the story has uh, dominated some of my attention for the last little while. This, this, this business, this $115 billion a year business, tenth, in the top 10 companies in America, launched a major e-commerce site. And uh, the new site was launched without any good science, any good testing, and the new site converted. Now, conversion means that with the 100 people who visit this site, if two purchase, that would be a conversion rate of 2%. Does everyone follow the basics? Yeah. So the conversion rate at this site, after launching this and spending many tens of millions of dollars just in development and then all the experts they brought in, was launched in producing 72% less than the original site. Now imagine yourself being the team responsible for bringing that news to management, and they did. And it created a fur uh, all over the organization Millions of dollars spent, and we went backwards. So uh, I was leading a conference in San Francisco, our own conference, and, uh, and I, so it's put on by our research lab, and it's important for me to be there. And I opened it and then gave my notes to one of my assistants who's become much more than that. He's sitting right over there, and he finished it for me. His name is Austin, and he's a, he's a brilliant young man. And I uh, jumped on a plane and flew there. 
Not because there was any business offer given to us, but because the man responsible for this was my friend. And as a philosopher, I'm, I, I, I think of business differently. I think of it as a series of relationships and friendship being the dominant motive for much of what I do. They set up a war room for me, and we went to work. Well, the new site has launched, and what you can see is that we, we took the first, raised its conversion rate as fast as we could to get it up to the 3%, which is V1 right there. The, the, the word I got last night was that conversion has gone up to 4.9%. Now, 4.9 seems like a small number, but if you think about it, it's 63% more revenue for the new site. Now, that 63% increase in revenue does not come because, because somebody came up with an interesting design. At the heart of that is a question I've been researching for 20 years, and I want to speak to you about it in just a moment, because the subject today isn't really about business. I want to use commercial examples to make a point that's far more personal, something that has to do with your own life and what may happen in your future. But to get there, I need to point out what we've been learning in these years, and essentially I've been asking for 20-some years, why do people say yes? And for me, the conversion rate just represents one thing. More people are saying yes to a given set of options. And, and the, the key here was to apply 20 years of research to this difficult problem and ascertain why more people were saying no than anyone expected, and then to understand how to increase the yes rate. Now, if that has some bearing, it becomes more confusing, and I, I suppose that most of this time we're going to be in and out of some confusing content, but bear with me because I have a point and I'm going somewhere with it. I want to tell you about this, because both of these occurred on the same night. Last night I flew in, I'm staying at the Charles Hotel, and I, uh, which I understand is the wrong hotel to stay at. And uh, I, I'm staying at the Charles Hotel, and in the middle of the dinner, uh, a, a way, uh, server taps me on the shoulder and points, and I see a young couple at a table sitting next to mine, and he's pulling out a ring. And right there in the restaurant, he opens that ring up, and he proposes. And what happens? Sort of what you would expect. She didn't slap him in the face, which was good news. <laughs> His conversion rate was good. <laughs> She started crying, and then crying more, and people started clapping, and people started coming up to their table, and we watched two lives change. You would agree with me that no matter the outcome, two lives have just been changed. And, and you might think that, you know, that's an interesting point, but what does it have to do with this other sort of email that you received in the same night? It has everything to do with it. Because just as sure as a series of micro yeses led to the increase overall in the conversion rate of the first site. It was a series of micro yeses, carefully sequenced, that led to the big yes that occurred last night at the table and impacted these two young people's lives. And just as sure as what looks like might be pure commercial application, the science we've been sort of digging deep in for these last 20 years, just as sure as that, we can also see that it has an application to what we're doing in our own lives and the personal decisions that we're making every day. I uh, sort of want to share with you how this all began, and to do that, I'll just go into a little bit of a timeline. And to me, there's really just two dates on, on this timeline that matter the most, but let me tell you how it all began. I got involved in the internet in the earliest years, back before we had HTML, so there were no websites. I was working in Unix, and there was a few scientists communicating in this way. And it occurred to me at some point that this new medium had the potential to impact the entire world. I thought to myself, you know, if there were more nodes and greater bandwidth between the nodes, it could change everything. It could mean that media would be transformed, that we would do something at that point, a kind of phrase called narrowcasting, as opposed to broadcasting, one-to-one, peer-to-peer -one, -peer video, that there might be online transactions, and then perish the thought, because I was uh, soundly rebuked for this, that banking could occur online. By the way, just a FYI, skip ahead 15 to 20 years, and I just ran an experiment with a bank very near to here, 
And uh, the one test produced $100 million for them. Banking did come online. We know that story. But in those days, it was not. And frankly, I couldn't find anybody who knew what the Internet was or was in the slightest interested. I thought to myself, this deserves a research project. And so I began speaking with professors at the University of Cambridge. And I'm on the staff of Cambridge today. I was not in those days. And I couldn't find a single professor interested in doing a research project. I did the same thing in Oxford. And you know, at that point, you might take a hint and decide it's time to give up, or at least to find something with greater commercial appeal. But um, I kept thinking about one thing. I am trained as a philosopher. And although I'm accused of being a scientist, I'm really an experimental philosopher. I just want to do enough science to get deeper into the philosophy and understand what's going on. And I kept thinking to myself, I have witnessed the debates about the exchange of value. I was desperate to understand why people say yes. I realized it was a more fundamental question than many of us really considered. But I read hundreds of years of debate, as we often do in philosophy, and I thought, you know, if the Internet becomes what I suspect, we will be able to watch millions of decisions in real time. And from patterning those decision process, we can begin to extract genuine answers to this question. This motivated me. I had just been married. I've been married now 26 years. And I... I had to talk to my wife about whether I should fund this research lab or not. I was running another lab at the time. And so we did the long walk on the beach in Florida and <laughs> talked and all of those things that, you know, I, we were, I was thinking about it last night when I watched the couple propose. My wife was with me. I've been on the road for a month and I actually sent her a ticket in New York and said, just come, fly to New York. <laughs> she said, I'll come to New York. And then she got to New York and I tricked her into getting on a train to Boston. She, <laughs> she, she thought she was going home. Micro, yes. You'll see more as it unfolds. So she's here now, and I'm here, and she's out enjoying Boston. She said, do I, should I come to your lecture? Which really means, I've seen enough of your lectures. Do I have to come to your lecture? And, uh, and I said, no. And so, so I, 26 years ago, did this walk with her, made the decision to fund the research and begin. And what's interesting about this timeline is you can see that it was in the 80s when we began the research, but in 90 we formalized the program, and it wasn't until 2001, that's 11 years before we published any of our findings. That's a long time in the wilderness. Everything changed for me once we published the first report. In that single year, we grew to over 100,000 companies subscribing to our research. And we continued to expand and grow until till now, We've tested, we've run experiments really on 15,000 cell paths. We have analyzed, recorded 5 million phone calls understanding the yes decision patterns. We've had 500,000 conversations with senior leaders around the world. All of this being recorded, analyzed, and studied in the lab. And we've built research operations all over the globe in different languages and cultures where we could study the theory and see, is it working in this culture? You know, have we found something that's too American? or to, to West, Western world to apply. And in doing so, we've been learning a lot. So we've created research labs inside of many of the top companies in the, in the world. And in fact, um, here in Boston, I, you probably don't know this, but the Boston Globe runs on our servers. All the paths. Shortly after the launch of their new pay product, they found poor conversion rates and poor performance. So we put it in the lab here in your city, and we're running all those experiments, and we've dramatically driven up their numbers. <coughs> Same thing for the New York Times. Uh, it runs on our servers. Over 300 paths are being tested while, I, while I'm here today, alternate ways, sort of corroborating our theories. Now, I only share that with you to set up where we're going today, because in a sense, we're going to look at commercial examples because they have given me a, a way to test something. But all along the way, I was never excited about the commercial application. I just had a problem. I needed to fund my research. And I knew that I could take a sliver of what I was learning and apply it to commerce and probably create a remarkable gain. And in doing so, I could fund a research budget and not be dependent on Oxford or Cambridge or, or the Templeton Foundation or some grant organization. And today we have the world's largest research budget in the field. 
we're the largest laboratory studying this uh, topic, and, and we, we have been very fortunate to create sort of a virtuous circle to fund our research. Where does that all come, and how does this all apply to you? Well, I, I wanted to show you that, but this won't be uh, uh, an attempt to either entertain you or even give you some useful information. I can't find the motivation to do that. I, I, I was talking to my friend here, and in three days I had an hour and 15 minutes sleep. I was trying not to let you see me yawn. Last night I got my first four hours, and it's, uh, it was nice. I want to have some more. It's a good idea, sleep is. I, I don't have the energy to stand here and to do yet another lecture unless I can see something more profound occurring, and that's what motivates me. I've never been motivated by building a big company. Um, we've turned down huge offers because I wanted control so that I could build something beautiful as opposed to something big. Sometimes companies I see remind me of the guys I see when I'm working out in the gym who take a lot of steroids. <laughs> they get big, but down inside they're not very healthy. In fact, most of them can't even function sexually. And I have literally had these conversations saying, so what's the point? Because you're on the beach and the girls are looking at you, but you're, uh, you're uh, limited. <laughs> and I, seriously, seriously, I have been in multi-billion dollar companies thinking to myself, you just had, you got steroids in the form of capital, went on the acquisition trail, you've diluted your value proposition, you look big, but you're impotent. And I don't want to be one of those companies and uh, I'm not motivated by that. I'm motivated by transformation when I see it in the lives of, of students and, and people like Austin who has just become, you know, uh, when this young lady spoke and she did a very fine job, she, uh, you weren't here Theo, she's 19 years of age, she ran for mayor in San Diego, she's published two books and I bet you more people have read her books than ours combined. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and she asked the audience to, to identify what brings them the most joy. And uh, I was sitting next to where you are now, and Mark Bertrand was sitting right there, and Mark told me this wonderful answer uh, and, uh, that I don't want to say for him because it's too profound to quote. And, and I thought my first thing in my, in my mind was uh, my, my wife, and then I, I thought deeper and I said, you know, I said to him, I know the right answer, and that was the right, that was a right, and, and it connects to my second answer. But I said to him, I, I don't want to say the right answer, that's what everybody expects you to say. I want to say the real answer, and the real answer is, and it's something that I didn't know when I was 20, I didn't know it when I was 30. I did it instinctively. When I was 35, I was doing it instinctively, but as I've gotten near 50, you start to realize how you're wired. And nothing sort of brings me more joy than seeing uh, lives transformed, seeing I, I, my office is a classroom. In the middle of our campus, I have nine young leaders. He, this guy is one of them who travel with me everywhere. They're all being trained and mentored. And as I see them take on responsibility and, and achieve more and more, it's, it's so rewarding. And I realize that you can't say to somebody, you should do that, and then they do it because you say you should. I realize that it's one of those things in life that I can't help but do that I'm sort of compelled somehow from the inside out and it brings me joy. And it's the motivation for even speaking with you today. I heard some people talking to me before I came in about the size of the crowd preparing me. Even Austin was preparing me for the smaller crowd in, in the room. I said, Austin, I don't care about the size of the crowd once I start teaching. I'm just looking at the people in that room and I know if I have a chance to impact their thinking, it's worth it. And if not, who cares whether it's thousands or hundreds? Sometimes one person in the room can achieve more than, than anybody in your crowd of 10,000 or all of them combined. And so that's my goal. I, I want to share something with you that's taken me 20 years to say. And I can't say it directly because, as Kierkegaard would say, some things can't be learned directly. You have to sort of absorb them and they, they come into you in a way that's more profound than if a teacher just says something to you. And so we're going to move sort of around the edges before we move into the heart of it. And much of what I want to say, I will only imply. Uh, but that isn't to say that I want this to be an abstract conversation. I'd like it to 
motivate you in a new way to think about how you're going to impact the world with your life. And to do that, I'll get past all of this. You needed to know this so you understand the research basis. That's all. It isn't to make me look important or have authority in the sense of some sort of pretentious, you know, place. It does allow me, however, to, to drive you to ask and answer some questions. And if you will participate with me today, we'll get more out of this. And I've got some things I'm going to ask you to do, even to work on, even to write before we're done. But I'd like to share with you behind me <laughs> the New York Times. I have two pages up. And I, I want to test your intuition. I don't care whether your job is marketing or not. It doesn't matter. You're either, uh, if you're not a marketer, you're a customer, right? You buy things. And you would see perhaps these two pages and you'd have to decide which one do you think will produce the most yeses, which we would call conversions. Clicks on those button and people that sign up for the New York Times service. This is the electronic edition of the New York Times, not the digital. That's a different story that I won't get into now. All I want you to do is look at the two pages and we want to hold up one finger for the version A, two fingers for version B. We're going to do it all together. Let's see what you think. Now, just a word of caution. This will be on your permanent school record. <laughs> There's cameras back there, and we, 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 will, be, we will be recording your every response. Uh, so, so take a look. I've got to move fast. I'm running out of time, and so let's move swiftly. Let's raise our hands and vote. Be brave. Hands up in the air. One or two fingers. Let me see. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Look around the room now. Everybody hold your hands up. All right. Good. I see your, I see your hands. You can place them down. Uh, I would say the twos have it by 90%. Let's take a look at version A, version B, and what happened? This page, version A, produces 47% more yeses. Okay? If you got the answer wrong, you're fine. I do the same test in the marketing groups of the smartest companies in the world, and I even did a study on marketers' intuition. I did the same study twice. And what I found, uh, Mark, was when I asked them these questions, 72% of all marketers got it wrong. The second time we ran the study, 74% got it wrong. <laughs> So, so we're not doing much here to change the world on our side, but it's, it's an interesting point. And by the way, this is the need for science. People say to me, because we, we patented and invented a lot of the ways that testing is done in our lab, they believe that my excitement is about testing. No, testing is a means to an end. I wish I lived in a world where I never needed to test. Testing is an indication that there's a problem with my level of wisdom. And the only way I'm going to acquire it is with an experiment. I'm trying to understand how people are thinking. So, I'll show you another one. Three Google AdWords. If you've ever been to Google, you've seen these at the top of the page or down the side. There are three versions, same company, where it says keyword, that means whatever word you searched is inserted there. And then you'll see it right here. So just put, just think about that. In fact, you can just put accounting uh, or, or something like that in, in your mind in those two blanks. Which ad, one, two, or three? One finger, two fingers, three fingers, let's vote fast. And don't be, it's, it's very okay if you're wrong. Okay, I'm watching. I'm watching, I'm watching, I'm watching. Good, all right, let's get a vote. 21% more yeses to this ad. All right, let's go again. This is for a nonprofit foundation. And this is the first page. This is the second page. I'm going to put them up side by side. One and two, take your vote. Version A or version B? Let me see your fingers. Okay, interesting. 54% for version A. 54% more said yes. One more, oh no, you, this is particularly for you because I know Boston, George Bush is very popular here. <laughs> so this is version A and version B. All you're seeing, this is the same article and it's about raising money and it's by one of the largest foundations in the world, and, and you'll see the differences. Please accept this invitation to stand with the President and Miss Bush by making a tax-deductible online contribution now. And then see, please accept this invitation, become a charter member of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. This is Bush's Presidential Library. This was a fundraising campaign for the Presidential Library, and there are only one, there's only one change in this entire letter, and it is those two things, and if you know where they're at, they're right at the bottom, just above the signature. So you might even wonder why would that either one of these have much impact, right? Because they're very similar. But first of all, vote. One or two. Let's see our hands. Okay. Good. And the winner is 
Version A. That's 139% more. And it leads to something very interesting. You don't really optimize letters or websites. The, the person who understands what we're going to talk about today optimizes the thought sequence. In the end, it's not about the, the outside collateral because there is no such thing even as a web page. It's not a page. And it's really not a web, okay? It, you can't cut it with a pair of scissors. You can't light it on fire and match. It is zeros and ones creating an illusion that triggers response in the mind. And one of the problems that we see, for instance, that store that we showed you at the beginning with the 4.9, 63% increase, the designers of the world from probably the world's sexiest design agency that built it were looking at pages and graphics and art, but they failed to see past that, through that, into the mind of the person interacting with the options or the offers. And so they, they built a beautiful website instead of crafted a beautiful way to guide the thought sequence. So think more about that for just a second and understand that all of these pages, I'll give you one more since uh, we are at school. Here is uh, University of New England. And uh, we didn't design this, they came to a class. I was lecturing and the man went back and created some pages. You can't tell which one it is. And they're very similar also, and I wouldn't expect the average person to know which one of these is best, but if you're looking at them, vote now one last time and sort of remember how you voted, all right? Version A, version B, good, 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 good. And the answer is 300% increase. Now, try to be, I mean, remember this, I remember this student contacting us afterwards. They sent us all the raw data. He, he built the page based on what he learned in the class, and then they, because we have to certify the data by our scientists, our data scientists. Speaking of which, disclaimer, the 4.9% that I spoke with in the beginning was sent to me last night by the company's statisticians, but it has not been certified by my science team, so it may not be right. I, I want to study that, and I just want you to have that accuracy. But here's the thing. He got to report to his senior leadership that he had tripled the leads coming into his company. And that had a major impact on his career. And I could tell you story after story like that. In fact, inside of Reuters, I remember working with a young woman named Joanne. Her last name was Kessley. I don't mind giving you her name because she's lectured on this in uh, New York and in Boston. She could not get products launched because she couldn't get Reuters technology to work properly to support her. We came in, optimized the system, gave her the test to run. She couldn't run the test, so we put her on our platform. In fact, all of Reuters ran on our platform for two years, all e-commerce. And the success was so phenomenal for her that she was written up in Forbes magazine and promoted to the global head of e-commerce and sent to London. And I could tell you story after story like that where, you know, these, remember behind these numbers, they're just real people trying to get a result. and This has an impact on them. But there's a, a more profound question, and, and that is looking at all of this, what was it that moved more people to say yes? Underneath the lift is a learning. And what is that specific learning that could enable you in your own life to achieve more yeses? And the answer lies in a two-word sort of concept that is talked about frequently in business, never applied to anyone in their personal life, and rarely understood by anyone who uses it. It's the words value proposition. And it's at the heart of what I want to talk to you about today. And you'll see more as this unfolds, how the commercial examples lead to an understanding that it could have a profound impact on two things in your life. An examination of why you've said yes, and an, and an understanding as to why people would say yes to you. Why do they choose you when you bring a business deal to them? Why do they choose you instead of the other person? Why, in your case, you spoke about four suitors who, suit before you sold your company, he did a very superb job with his company. I, I know the CEOs of the other companies that were involved, and I knew especially the, you know, the PR inside. And, and uh, it's an amazing story, what he did. He was, it was David and Goliath. And he came in with a slingshot and slew the giants, and they were all, they were all ready to buy him because they didn't know what else to do with him. They couldn't kill him. <laughs> they tried. And, uh, and my point for you is he chose one offer and he, made, he said something in his lecture just so, so fast, I don't know if you caught it. He said if, if Business Wire had gotten there a week earlier, he'd have taken half the money from them. 
That tells you a lot. And, and there's a reason why you would choose one or the other. There's a reason why when you leave this school, some of you have and, and some of you have, you'll be chosen by a particular employer. There's a reason why you'd be chosen for a promotion, chosen by uh, an equity fund to, to back, chosen by a spouse or a potential partner in your life. And that's what the real point of this is. And I can tell you that the two sides of that question, why have I chosen yes and why would someone choose me, has transformed my life. It's also screwed it up big time. <laughs> I, I don't want to make this too personal, but I will tell you something I've never said in the lecture before. This is an appropriate venue for it. I began my life born in the home of a missionary, raised in the bush in the Yukon with no electricity and no running water. My father is consistent, my best friend, he's 80 years old, he's a conservative Christian pastor. I was raised in that environment. I was not only raised in it, but I thrived in it until I started asking these stupid questions I'm sharing with you today. <laughs> I walked away from a lot, and I'm a long ways from where I was in my thinking. But the reason was when I began to analyze why did I say yes, I didn't like what I discovered. And most of all, and I'd love this, this is a different lecture, I've discovered my number one enemy in life is not someone from the outside, but it's my own self-deception. If you'd asked me 10, 15 years ago if I was honest, I would say yes. I don't lie on my income taxes, I won't cheat you in a business deal, etc., etc., etc. My God, as I started discovering how dishonest I truly was, you know, you laugh about it now. Go ahead. Thanks for the sympathy. Uh, I went through some brutal times and still am. All of it comes back to what we're going to be talking about in these next few moments. So let me just make two or three statements from uh, a book that I, I have written. Marketing as a philosophic concept transcends marketing as a business term. Marketing is more fundamental and thus more universal. Wherever choice exists, marketing exists. My son wants to get into Harvard. He's got to market himself. And the professor trying to get tenure in Harvard, he's got to market himself. And the professor trying to get a budget for his research interests, he's marketing himself. Even the scientist trying to get his theory accepted, don't, don't mistake the fact that he's not marketing. In fact, the second point says, if marketing is messaging and offer, then politicians, scientists, and pulpiteers all engage in it. In each case, they are asking for a yes to their candidacy, their theory, or their gospel. In fact, I read a fascinating article. It's in one of the journals. These are two uh, uh, research professors, uh, uh, Peter and Col Olson. And he says, the, the whole premise of the article is that science itself is marketed. He says, as the discipline most concerned with exchange processes, marketing provides a relevant perspective for understanding science. Science is an activity performed by interacting human beings and thus obviously is a social process. We believe these social interaction processes are very important for understanding science. In fact, the exchanges that take place during these social processes constitute a major reason for our contention that science is marketing. I mean segmentation i.e. who you're appealing to, your theories, the cost of adopting a new theory over an older theory, it has a very tangible cost. And the, the paradigm shifts or the movements, including the movements discussed in your lecture, have an impact on the receptivity of a particular theory. We'd like to think that it's just all logic and reason, but we know better if we spend too much time in that world. Now, this isn't about science, this is about you. But the point is marketing has much greater implications than what we think about in a commercial enterprise. Which leads me to this question, why do people say yes? And so, I, uh, I would make this statement. Our lives, if not our beings, are the sum of our choices. We choose and others choose, and the combination can define us. So, how can we increase our probabilities of being chosen? That's really what the whole point of today is about. And with that in mind, I want to take you through three points, and the first one is this. We must understand the value proposition as a framework for predicting choice. Now, I share that with you because uh, most of us 
don't know what that term means. And most of us in business still don't know what that term means. And most of us starting a business are woefully ignorant. We did a research project. It was very simple. We offered a $100,000 prize to anybody who could give me a business plan on a three by five file card. Now, we got interesting entries, okay? We had people, over 400 entrepreneurs submitted for this prize and they wrote their business plan, some of them in two point font, the entire plan on a card. <laughs> Sent the card and a magnifying glass. My premise behind studying business plans is typically they're an investment brochure. I don't buy them. If you can't give me the reason on a business card, a file card, an envelope, uh, the back of a napkin, why your, why your particular initiative could thrive, I'm suspicious of it. And in this case, we analyzed these 400 entries, and here's how we sort of thought about them. We created a five-point scale. I won't actually go into the scale right now, but you can just know this. Five is best, one is, you know, barely above zero. You get it? So, in that, here's my question for you. You don't have to actually answer, but how many do you think of these submissions score a five? Now, we know 80% of all new business initiatives fail. That's a typical statistic in, in enterprise investigation. But let me just suggest to you what we discovered. Out of, out of 400, only 275 even had an attempt to articulate a value proposition. And there were only six that got to four and none that got to zero. And many of these people think their problem is they don't have enough capital. But capital is not the problem. An attractive value proposition will find the capital. You've got to have the right value proposition. And worse, I am in the C-suite with CEOs all over the world, and I will ask them and their entire C-suite team to write down on a separate piece of paper the organization's value proposition, and the shocking point is twofold. One, they don't put down the same answer. <laughs> That's scary when you think they're running the organization. But the scariest part would be appreciated by my deeper thinkers in the room, and that is they don't even use the same framework. In other words, the term value proposition means something different to many of the people sitting at the table. So how do you answer this question? Because most of us don't realize that the phrase value proposition is new in our language, and here's what we did in research. We went through millions of records. We found 1,100 academic articles that mattered. We studied all of them. Only one or two even proposed a framework. The rest assumed it into their, into their writing. We then read every single popular book, and some of those were better than the academic articles that we read. And, and then we said, you know what? The term came to birth around 1997, although it was mentioned prior to that by the same person, Michael Lanning. But, but maybe its concept is in the historic work of the experts in this field. And so we constructed a timeline. We went back 110 years and we went through all of the literature. And some of those names may not be familiar to you, but we found, for instance, that David Ogilvy, who most of us all know, was heavily influenced by Claude Hopkins. And so was Rosser Reeves. They were friends, Ogilvy and Rosser Reeves. In fact, Ogilvy said, you can't work on my team unless you've read Hopkins' book seven times. And Hopkins and others used some phrases that contained part of the framework, but nobody had a lucid, clear framework. And then we said to ourselves, all right, so if we're going to define a framework, we don't want to be like the American Marketing Association who argues for five years about what the word marketing means and then settles on a compromise language. We just want to say this, the proper answer is the most functional answer. Uh, the answer that allows someone to get the greatest results. And that will be the answer that we adopt, and then someone else can argue about the finer points of what it should or should. As long as our framework is getting the most yeses, we'll continue to use that framework. And if someone can improve that framework, wonderful. Well, that launched us into a series of tests. Thousands of experiments, and, and candidly, th the term had never been researched. We built a framework from patterning successful uh, sort of pathways, mental pathways, where there was an offer. And we continued to build until this is like a, a huge journal. Every single line is an abstract. We had thousands of these experiments and their findings, all in test protocols, all in our library. What did we discover? Well, it leads to the question. What is the framework? Because 
do you understand that that's what I need to communicate to you first? Let's get the framework in our mind and then let's talk about its specific application. So the answer to this question, what is a value proposition, is really sort of locked up in another more profound question. And indeed, we came up with the effective answer, but that answer isn't necessarily the one you want to hear in a 60-minute lecture. And in fact, uh, Chopin said, simplicity is the final achievement. After one has played a vast quantity of notes and more notes, it is simplicity that emerges as the crowning reward of art. And in keeping with Chopin's uh, observation, I would suggest that we can answer and take all of the heuristics that you see behind this and summarize them within a single question that may seem so simple as to first lose its profundity until we unpack it. But you need to understand it because in a minute I'm going to apply it to you and ask you to actually spend some time thinking and writing. Just a few minutes. Here is the question. First I'll give you the commercial side of it. If I am, very important, your ideal prospect, why should I buy from you rather than any of your competitors? Now, that question starts to answer, and I'm going to break down every word because every word is chosen. And we'll get to it in just a moment. But before we do, let's, uh, let's understand it a little bit deeply. So there's the, there's the question. But as Kierkegaard said, it's useless for a person to want, first of all, to decide the externals, and after that, the fundamentals. And the danger, listen, especially I say this with empathy to a lot of the young people in this room, so many of us, our lives right now are being shaped by externals because we haven't grappled with the fundamentals. Deep down inside, we haven't looked at our life through the right lens. And we're thinking about the job and these other pieces before asking the more profound, deeper questions that will shape all that happens to us. I will uh, say more about that later, but instead, I'd like to unpack that underneath this is the philosophical underpinning. If I am blank, why should I take this action rather than the other actions? Now, now you can start to fill this into other areas of your life. If I am a single guy, single girl, why should I marry this guy rather than those other four guys that want to marry me? <laughs> okay? Now, as silly as that might sound, it's actually the sort of question that we grapple with all the time in our life, and it may not be that. Why should I go to this university instead of those universities? Why should I take this job instead of that job? Or why should I hire this person instead of that person? Why should I make this investment instead of that investment? Once you understand that beneath that very important question that drove the 4.9%, 63% increase we looked at, or that drove the 300% increase in leads for the University of New England, is, is this deeper philosophical concept. And if we take it down to its fundamental, we can apply it to our lives. Which leads to an understanding of the commercial concept so we can apply it to our own. I'm just going to come back here and look at it with you together, all right? So, so here is the first key. You are fundamentally answering a first-person question posed in the mind of your customer. It always implies a because answer. Any answer you write down that doesn't or couldn't have the word because in front of it means it's not a reason. And if it's not a reason, it's not a value proposition. And more importantly than that, you have to say, if I... When I ask other people this question, we, we try to answer it with, in a business, company logic instead of customer logic. Company logic starts with the selfish self-interest of the group thinking. And I, as a human being, have this same self-interest, which I have found, despite all my work in theology, <laughs> I can't eliminate. And uh, I'm so sorry to Wesley and the Methodists and some of the others that would like to help me eliminate it altogether, but I can't. Self-delusion made me think I was eliminating it, and then I got underneath my motives and said, my God, man, there's something wrong with you. And there is. However, I can discipline it. And the first move, the first thought move, is to get out of my skin and into the skin of the other person, a sort of kenosis. And once I'm in their skin, I've got to look back at my offer through their eyes. And that is the hardest move for any human being. It is so difficult to step out of what I want and what I need and see the world through the other set of eyes at the heart of every failure in business I've ever seen is this essential problem. So the second point is 
A value proposition focuses on a specific segment. I cannot be all things to all people, neither can a company. That means you have to accept trade-offs in life. And trade-offs are one of the keys in business. You've got to be able to focus on this, which means you can't do that. One yes means 10,000 no's. I said earlier in an observation on my blog a month ago, the core of my enterprise is shaped by my yeses, but its perimeter, or is the, the core of my, the essence or core of my enterprise is formed by my yeses, but the shape or its perimeter is formed by my noes. And, and one yes equals many thousand noes. And that's why you've got to be willing to take the trade-offs by focusing, which brings me to a third point. Why should I? A value proposition is an ultimate reason and it's a reason why, and in truth, in the academic sense, it is an argument with a powerful reason supported by evidentials, but sort of summarized in one articulation. It forms an argument for why I should hire you instead of someone else, or why you should buy my product instead of another. Finally, a value proposition must differentiate you from your competitors in at least one way. There must be an only factor. Now this is going to be big when we start talking about your own life. If I am to choose you over another, there must be something about you that is only, that is different, that has a reason why you would be the best choice. You may equal the other person on every other dimension of value, but there is a thing, something about you. And what I've discovered is one of the great mysteries of life is that the way we're designed, most of us have within us something like that, but it's obscured until we've lived long enough to discover it, or until we've given up what we think we want and accepted what we really are. Now, why does that become important? By the way, it's a fascinating study in literature. Professor, when you see those characters who are going through this, the great writers can show you the conflict between the discovery of who I really am and how I bring value to the situation, and who I want to be and who I think I am. And a lot of the great, great works have been this sort of personal discovery, and the greater writers don't tell it to you directly, they show it to you in the, in the transformation of the character, and you, you see it happening. They don't get ponderous and awkward the way they describe it. I go on. So how does this framework connect to you personally? Well, in business, we have four types of value propositions. We have a primary value proposition. We have a prospect level, which simply means uh, how you answer that question for small businesses if that's one of your markets. We have a product level, which means not just the company, but a particular product. Why would I buy that product instead of any other? And we have a process level, which means why would I fill out this form or make this move transition instead of a different move? This is where we lose them in our sites and our paths. I can't teach those now. That's an eight-hour lecture. I can only I can only point out that in the lecture, I talk about the four P's. I rarely ever discuss this. There's a fifth P, and that is the personal value proposition. And that's what we're here about today. Now, let's think about that for a moment because it applies. Here's an example. If I'm a Fortune 100 company, why should I hire you rather than hire any other recent graduate? If I am a grant agency, why should I fund your research project rather than fund any other research project? If I am a single guy or girl, why should I go out with you rather than any other single guy or girl? Do you see how it starts to have an application? Now, it's important you think about that because here's what I'd like to do with you now. In the next point, we're going to discuss the role of the value proposition and how to take whatever answer you have and intensify its force. Michael Drew, how old are you, Michael? 34. 34, ambitious, has written his book, has developed a unique expertise in getting bestsellers on the list. But Michael, what is the value proposition that you bring into the world that you could bring so unique that sets you apart and, and has you to be chosen by whoever it is you determine you're supposed to serve with your life. I'm, I'm not asking you on this. You can answer if you want. I help people share their voice. Okay. All right, so uh, he builds platforms and, uh, and, and he has an answer for that question. I'm gonna ask you to take a few minutes and do something. It's very important that you, 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 you connect with one other person sitting here and you may not know them, it's okay. I want to get the most out of our time together, and if you don't actually think about this and what answer you would give, and you can give it two or three ways. You can talk about, in fact, let me back up the slide. 
You can pick one of these areas, like if you want to think about employment, if you want to think about relationships, if you want to think about something in your career that's a choice where you need to be chosen, or if you want to think about your entire life's main contribution, who you're serving and how. You were talking about what you're thinking about that as, as you were speaking, right? And how you're discovering this. And sometimes it has to be discovered. But just take a few moments, because I want you to actually, in a minute, Look at your answers in light of what I'm going to show you next and analyze the efficacy or the effectiveness of what you've written. So there is a point to this besides let's have a nice little activity. We all go to school and get sick of those. Uh, this is important. Take a few minutes and make noise. This isn't a church. You can talk, work, <laughs> thank, and, and then we're going to talk about it in just a second. Have you began to get something on paper? If it's not perfect yet, it's all right because we're going to start to work on it together. It really is an exercise that should go on past this time and should take place when you sort of uh, leave here. In fact, executives, when I'm speaking to leaders, they often, I'll say, book some time in a hotel room, call it a conference, and just be you, a yellow pad, and some solitude. Because it's important to think about such things uh, in the right place and in the right environment, allow you to sort of get this down. And you may not achieve the perfect answer yet. Some of this has to be discovered in time. But once you begin to think through the framework, you begin to recognize the answer more and more. So let's continue. Because now, whatever answer you have, by the way, should begin with, or I should be able to put a because. And it should sort of begin with a question, why would, and using that same framework, you fill in the blanks, and then your answer, even if it's not the answer you'd write in a book, or a journal, or a piece of marketing copy, it is a because answer. And one of the first cues that I have that the answer is going to be wrong is if it doesn't take the form of a reason. Okay? It's a why question and it deserves a reason. But once you have the reason, there becomes this question of how do you amplify the intensity? Value propositions have a force. I'll give you this example. I was sitting in New York City, it was Johnson & Johnson, and they were launching a new product. And they spent $90 million getting ready. They had a burn rate of a million and a half a month, $40 million in development, $50 million in the marketing budget, and I was called in late. I'd been lecturing, and the leader said, could you come in and listen to us? We're making final plans. I sat at a long conference table on the end and didn't say anything. Why I was listening to lots of advertising agencies and consultants at the table all talking about this exciting launch, I was taking notes, and I had just taken their value proposition as poorly as it was articulated, measured its force. At the end, not a popular thing to say, the senior leader in the room looked at me and said, Dr. McLaughlin, you've been listening to all this. What do you think about our new launch? <laughs> I'm not the right guy to answer that because a guy pursuing uh, the destruction of his self-deception often says things that may not be popular. You have to be careful. So my answer, a uh, very cultivated answer was, we're all doomed to hell. <laughs> Which caused some consternation in the room. In my anticipation that that might happen, I said I would only come if the senior leader would go out for drinks with me afterwards. So I'd listen. I had a feeling I needed to say more than I could say in the room. And we went out right afterwards. And I said to him, uh, I won't, I won't, this isn't his name, I don't want to reveal his name, I said, Neil, uh, I, I have two observations. Your value proposition has no force. You need to sell, I, I don't remember how many units it was, like 50,000 units in your first year. I doubt you're going to sell 1,000 in your first 90 days based on some calculations. He looked at me white as a sheet. I said, once more, I, I also think you're going to lose your job. <laughs> and I didn't know this man. And, he, and, he, and, he, and again, he was chagrined. He said, why would I lose my job? I said, because I watched your senior leader come in his, I mean, this is top brass in J&J, &J, come in and ask questions. And I don't know if you realize this, but they were setting you up. I said, I'll bet it was her idea. He said, it was her idea. And she hired me to execute it. Well, if you're successful, she's going to take the credit, I said. And if you're not, you're going to take the blame. It was all in that room, and I don't think you caught the subtleties of the conversation. And so he was properly chagrined. He thanked me. A few weeks later, I'm in the Florida Keys with my family on vacation, and a call rings, and I recognize its extension. I, I didn't really want to answer business calls on my vacation, but I had compassion for this guy, and so I picked up the phone, and his first words 
I, I'm not embellishing the story, was Dr. McLaughlin, you were right. I said, what happened? He said, the launch is an abysmal failure. We've sold less than 500 units. And he said, uh, I just lost my job. Good news is, he got another one. <laughs> we made some calls. He's good. And he's a friend now. And we built trust with each other. And I can only tell you that for me, it was not hard to predict the failure, not because I'm very clever, but because there is a way to measure the force of a value proposition. And there's a way to measure the force of your value proposition. And while I can't talk about the mathematical equations, I can show you the concepts, and the concepts alone are enough for you to think about how effective, how forceful your answer is. All right? And that's where we're going next. But first, we have to understand how the value proposition plays a role. How many of you in business have heard about the sales or marketing funnel? Can I see your hands just to get a sense of the room? You know, most people typify what happens in sales as sort of a funnel that people move through, like a website, all the pages on a website, and the ads that lead up to the pages of the website. Or in any form of business, there is funnel. The funnel is, a, is important because it represents something that's close to what happens in the decision process, but it's so misunderstood by those who talk about it. First of all, the funnel is not comprised of like pages and ads. The funnel is comprised of the cognitive fabric of the mind. That's the skin on that funnel behind me. And it's really about the sequence of thought. And there is a map of that thought sequence that's very important for you to understand. But before you can really understand that, you need to realize, you know, Kuhn, the, Thomas Kuhn said this, the scientist who embraces a new paradigm is like the man wearing inverting lenses. What he's saying is to, to embrace a new paradigm, you almost have to put on a new lens and see things differently. We need to do that with the funnel also. And I'll tell you what the problem is with the funnel. People aren't falling into the funnel. They're falling out. Let me explain to you. When you have a website and you have an offer and 100 people see the offer, you often feel good if 98 fall out and 2 say yes. 2% is an average conversion rate. Why are they falling out? Because all of society and, and human nature conspires to drag them out of the funnel. They are distracted. They see competing offers. There's problems with the website or the technology. All of those things cause them to stop. And when they stop, they don't complete the process. How many of you have started a purchase and haven't finished it? You get confused, there's friction, they're asking for information you don't want to give, you're concerned about the customer service, there's all these reasons that we hesitate and we don't complete. Now, that's important to note because the task of the marketer, whether it's a business or not, think of marketer in a much broader sense, is to, is to work against that. And so the only way to represent the funnel is to flip it. Do you see how we've inverted it from this to this? From this to this. Now we have reality here. It's upside down. And you don't drive people in, you draw them in. Nobody drives traffic to a site, to a store. You have to track them. You have to, you have to somehow pull them in. And as they're coming in, they have to overcome the resistance of gravity. Let gravity stand for all those distractions and interruptions and competing offers and technology that gets in the way. And so the sort of aha moment here is understanding, wait a second, my job is to work against this gravity and, and, and somehow draw people up. And they don't come up the middle, they come up the sides. And I won't dwell on this point right now. Discovering answers requires intense and sustained effort of imagination. The relation of sequence, that's the word I want you to get in this quote, among the phenomena must be seen. They're hidden, and they can only be seen mentally. Now, why is that important? Because a sense at the top of the funnel is a macro yes. Let's suppose that you're selling a product. When they purchase the product, you've achieved what I would call the macro yes. But before they get to the macro yes, there are many micro yeses, literal yeses they have to say to get to the macro yes. Yes to reading the headline. Yes from the headline in the body text. Yes from the body text in through the landing page. There are all these micro yeses. The reason we were able to take that site from 3.0 to 4.9 in conversion rate was because we were analyzing every single micro yes. And at every juncture where we found uh, the value proposition weak, we strengthened it. So that 
you know, one ad isn't, it isn't a micro yes to move from an ad to a landing page. That one ad might require six micro yeses in their mind, six uh, acquiescences to moving forward. The final is to click, which takes them to the landing page. And the landing page might have 12. Now, don't get caught up in web pages and websites. It's just an example. I use the web as my digital laboratory. I, it's not that I'm in love with the web. It's just a giant lab for me to watch. That's what I've been doing 20 years, is using it to understand the, the human thought process. Now, eventually we get to the macro. Yes, but even as it's true in business, Hegel said, Passions, private aims, and the satisfactions of selfish desires are the most effective springs of action. Their self-interest is the most effective spring of action. And you must draw them up the funnel with their self-interest. And it is the value proposition that forms the force that draws them up the funnel and into the macro. Yes. Where does that leave us? Well, it applies to that couple we saw last night. Now, let, let's just imagine that, uh, let me take this young lady that lectured today. Can I use you up here for just a moment? No, please, please. All right. <laughs> Tell us your first name again. I'm Alexis. All right, so Alexis, let's suppose, you stand right here. Let's suppose this is the bar tonight afterwards, because after hearing me, you'll probably need a stiff drink. And you stand over here on this side, okay? Right over here, yes. And I don't mean to be politically incorrect, but stand there like you're at the bar drinking, okay? And I'm over here. <laughs> She does this a lot. She's 19, but she's a heavy, heavy drinker. And so, so Alexis is there. And let's suppose I'm a young man interested in Alexis. I better get the micro yeses right. There's some problems if I do it wrong. For instance, if I walk up to her right now and pop open the box with a ring, <laughs> what do you think my odds are of winning a yes? Not too high. 50-50. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how much she's been drinking, all right? There are, some, there, are some, there are some exceptions to the rule, right? If we can impair their entire judgment, we may be able to get a yes. Then the, the, what, what, what if I didn't do that? What if I just walked up to her and, and kissed her full on the lips? You think that might be a problem? I think I'd be bounced out of the bar and that would be the end, right? What if I was more subtle than that? What if I walked up to her and said, hi, I'm uh, Flint McLaughlin. I have a four bedroom house on the beach. And uh, <laughs> how many children were you thinking about having? Do you, do you see what's happened? In every case, I've skipped important micro yeses. Now, in reality, I actually have to do something with her in order to get into a conversation. And if I don't, there's no chance of relationship. Now, same thing on the website. In fact, let's back it up for a second. On a website, when you hit that landing page, I've got to get you to read. I, and then reading is a mental conversation. That's one of the problems with a bad website. A bad website is a monologue. A good website is a dialogue. And I'm getting inside of your mind and guiding the conversation. So think about that for just a moment in this context. I walk up to her and I have to say something. Guys, what do we call this? Pick up lines. Yes. He says it with such, he's quick on these. He's been working on his pickup lines. So I need a pickup line. Now, you've probably heard some really lame pickup lines, right? And she doesn't generally face me this way, so let's turn and face the bar a little bit more, because you're not open to me yet, right? If I say the right thing, the most I can hope for, the first micro yes, is her body language changes and she just, she gives me that much. <laughs> now, I can blow it, guys. One wrong move now and it's all over. But if this went perfect and the conversation continued, what I could probably hope for as the culminating micro yes in this set, they come in sets would be for her to give me a way to contact her. Maybe a Facebook or a, a phone number, and I have a chance, right? Now, if I call her up and say, hey, I'm flying to Fiji for three days, I thought you might want to come, <laughs> I've probably blown it again. If I call her up and ask her for dinner, maybe, maybe not, depends on how strong my value proposition is being received, I might just call her up and invite her to Starbucks. Do, do you understand? Or text her and invite her to Starbucks. Simple, not too much commitment, and that might be the next way that moves. Okay, now, yes, we can give her a hand, all right, but bear this in mind now, very important. On that web page, guess what, I have a micro yes, and I have a pickup line. Do you know what a headline is? It is a pickup line. That's all a headline is. It is exactly a pickup line. Its job is to engage you in mental conversation. I need to drive you into the content below. Headline has two jobs, to capture attention and convert it to interest. That's it. 
If a headline doesn't capture my attention, I don't read it. If it captures my attention, it doesn't convert it to interest, I don't read what's below. The job of the headline is a pickup line exactly the same way this relationship is formed. And so last night in the restaurant, I was at engagement step. See that guy on his knees? That's what happened in the restaurant. But you know how many micro yeses were necessary to getting there? Probably a lot. <laughs> Probably a lot. Now, same thing. <laughs> I like uh, this quote from, from this Spanish writer philosopher. Forgive me if I have troubled you. I took up my pen proposing to distract you from your distractions. <laughs> That's sort of what our job is. I have to distract you from your distractions in order to get you to the next place. Here's the, here's the example for any of you that are looking for the right job. Same thing. I've got to get read. I've got probably the phone interview, then there's an initial in-person interview, then there may be five or six subsequent interviews, and then often we're hired on a sort of, whether they say it or not, probationary period for 90 days where we're determining whether or not we made the right decision. Each one of these requires a micro-yes process. You, you're following me so far? Now, your key here to getting to the macro yes is adjusting the value proposition at each one of these levels. I'll explain more of that in just a moment, but all I want you to know right now is while it might take a hundred yeses to get to a macro yes, it only takes one no to stop the entire progress. One no. This is why a hundred go in and two come out the other side. Because somewhere along the way, we didn't get enough yeses, we hit a no. Do you follow me? Now, the reason we've been so successful in the lab at getting more yeses is because we sort of avoid the common errors like this. Macro distortion is sort of thinking that a yes is just moving from the conversation to the date or from the ad to the landing page, when that one ad might have six micro yeses and I need to know them all and tune them all. And an and improper sequence comes when I walk up to her and show her the wedding ring or the kiss or the picture of my house. Do, do you understand that that's the wrong sequence? I'm out of order and it prevents the same thing. And, and assume value comes when I don't communicate or allow someone to see my value proposition and so they don't, they don't know. A lot of us go into the interview guys and we don't know how to communicate our value proposition. That's why we don't get the job. Do you understand? Our resume looks like everybody else's resume. And we have no way to cut through that barrier. Which leads me to sort of uh, the next point, but let's quote Henry James. Ideas are in truth forces infinite. Two is the power of personality. A union of the two always makes history. Read Apple. That's what happened with the personality of Steve Jobs and the ideas combined. That's what happens what good brand does. By the way, a brand doesn't make a promise. You, if you hear anything in marketing about that, don't believe it. If you make me a promise and I don't know you, I don't trust your promise. My guard is up. Good marketing doesn't make claims. It fosters conclusions and brand creates an expectation. If Apple turned out an eye chicken, we'd all stand in line to buy it. <laughs> Why? Because Apple has created the expectation that when you, when you buy one of their products, it's going to fit into your life. It's going to be fun to use. There's a certain experience that you expect from an Apple product. Now, if they disappoint us, that expectation will wane, and so does the power of the brand. Does that make sense to all of you? So I won't go dwell on that anymore, but brand is just the aggregate experience of the value proposition, and all it does is create an expectation. We turn it into something sexier and, and more ethereal, and that way we can cover up our bad wastes of money at the agency level. Let's keep going. Final point. We must understand how to intensify the force now, this is where in a moment I want you to be thinking about what you've written down on your pages. And I want you to see how forceful it is. And to help you do that, let's begin with a simple case study. Here's a page, Fortune 500 company, their best performing page. This is a page that doesn't know how to communicate a value proposition. They brought it to us for help. In fact, it was brought to me by a student in San Francisco. I was teaching, she was excited, she was into it, and then she got very troubled and I didn't know if I had said something wrong. She came up to me at lunch and she said, Dr. McLaughlin, I know we have a value proposition, but for the life of me, I can't figure out how to say it. Some of you may be struggling this way too right now. She had that problem and we had agreed to do a research project to help her. She was young, she wasn't high up in the company. What happened next changed her life, changed her career track. First of all, we analyzed that, that page here and we corrected it. I'll explain the corrections in a moment, but we built a value proposition articulation into the page. 
Now, remember, we want to do some experimental philosophy, some science. I don't want to give you a framework that sounds good to me based on my life experience. I want to give you something that's been tested thousands of times, and I know that when we apply this to a page like this, a result comes. Typically, it's predictable. In this case, there's the control, there's the treatment. What's the result? A 201% increase. That's double the business, but that's not all. More happened, but start with that. Can you imagine her, what that does for her? I know what it did for her. In fact, I'll tell you more why in a few minutes, but I was lecturing in a city and the CEO of that Fortune 500 company called me. And he looked like some guy off the set of Dallas. I mean, he was like, the, like a, an actor playing a CEO. He had the snow white hair and the perfect business suit. The conference room was all mahogany and beautiful. And he called me in to sit down and his CFO was with him. And he said to me, called me by name and said, what, and he caught me by surprise, what the blankety blank blank is going on in this division? First he, he looked angry. And I realized that the CFO was there showing the numbers and he couldn't figure out what the, had changed. And this young girl was sitting there now, first time she'd ever met him, big company. And she's sort of excited to be sitting there, right? And, and she's explained it, but he doesn't, you know, it's like, really? And so he gets me in there and we explain it. And of course his point is he wants to bring that all over the business. Now he had a reason, by the way, Private equity was getting ready, to, he was trying to sell himself back from the public market into private equity and he needed the performance to get the highest price. I didn't know that at the time, it was top secret. But she, her career took off like a rocket. You're going to see more why in just a moment. I want to unpack this, it's the last thing I want to work with you. I'm going to talk to you about these four force elements and, and then I will release you here. So how did we increase the force of the value proposition? Well essentially, at every micro yes, there is a cost force and a value force. And you are tuning this so the value force outweighs the cost force. Let me give an example. If I ask you for an email address, you're weighing. Do I really want more spam in my email box? What's going to happen when I give you my email? And the cost side of that, I don't mean price, is being weighed against what you're offering me. I'll look at some website that says, you know, download our, our free tips or sign up for our, you know, and it's like who wants to sign up for a free trip easy anymore? or a free tip, you know, where they're going to teach you. The, the, the value is so weak that they have a conversion rate on that offer of less than 1%. Suddenly, when you change what it is and describe it, show a picture of it, give a table of contents, and they realize, wow, this is good. Way more people sign up because you've put weight. And there's only two things I can do to make that fulcrum tip. What are they, physicist experts in here? Yeah, I got to take weight off one side or, and, or, or, and or put weight on the other. That's all we ever do at Mech Labs. That's, that's our whole job, all day long. And, and we're sort of, we, 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 most of our guys call themselves plumbers. We just go in and look at the pipes, we find the leaks, and we fix the leaks. And we do it by analyzing where the cost force is too high or the value force isn't high enough. And in doing so, this is what we did. The original page had too much cost force and we optimized it and gave it more value force and the result was the 200% increase. As the sort of pre-Socratic philosopher said, the mind is the source of all motion. And in the end, that yes and that actual motion to click is being driven by what's happening in the mind, not by pretty pictures on the site. Which leads me to breaking this formula down into just the four elements of force. We won't get into the technical side of it. It comes in the form of two dyads. And I want to show you exactly how this works because this applies to your own situation just as much as it does this website. I'm using the website because I want to present experimental data to you. Do you understand? As opposed to a motivational speech. And the data has translatable, transferable principles to our own situation. So here's the first dyad, appeal and exclusivity. And the first mistake is to think that those are words. They are not. They're cognitive conclusions. Forget. Forget the, the two words and read what comes after it. I have to create, foster a conclusion in your mind regarding whatever the offer is. I want it, but that's not enough. Because if I want it and there's six places to get it, there's no guarantee you're going to get it from me. I want it and I can't get it anywhere else. That has to be applied. So when I look at your answer, on that piece of paper, how you describe what you do must have a sort of essential appeal for whoever it is you're serving. 
There's a reason why people sign up for this professor's class and he's a popular professor as a teacher. There's something you do. I've been in your class. I've been in his class, so I know this. And I'm not uh, engaging in flattery. It's a good example. Students have a choice. The reason they would choose your class is because there's something about the way you teach that provokes the I want it. But if there were six professors doing the same thing, they, he might, they might choose a different class. But they sign up for this class because there's also another conclusion many of them come to and is I can't get this anywhere else. He does this differently. It helps me in a special way. That's how these two work. And if you start to understand them that way, it, uh, Popper said this, mere truth is not enough. What we look for are answers to our problems. And that's at the heart of what this appeal is. See, people, if you've ever had a marketing class, you'll hear this, market to people's needs and wants. But don't believe it. It's baloney. I know lots of people with needs who have no interest in a solution yet. Until their need becomes a want, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the wants. We have friends who need to get help with their alcohol problem. <laughs> but until they want help, you can't do a thing for them, right? And one of the greatest mistakes I've seen in business is lots of money put behind what we think people need, but it's not what they want yet. I saw 200, uh, 500 million wasted on an idea for, a, for an internet grocery store. People need it, but they didn't want it. So you've got to think about how a need becomes a want, and that's what you market to in the end. Now, stay with me, because let's go back to an example. Oh, you might like this example. So this is a competitor of our, the speaker who spoke before me, or it was before he sold his company. It was Pierre Newswire. And, and, and the goal here was to increase the click-through to get them into the offer, and the problem was this was the page. And we analyzed its appeal and exclusivity. That's the first dyad. Remember, there's another dyad coming. Let's look at it together. This is where we can learn, okay? So, most of what might be appealing in this offer is missed due to banner blindness. It's in the wrong location on the page, so it's not striking the thought sequence in the right order with the right impact. And the secondary headline is vague and has limited appeal by focusing on the cost. It's not enough. Distributing my content isn't that appealing. I don't want to distribute my content. I want to get something for distributing my content. I want to get a result. I want, I want thousands of people to come to my site, or I want to sell more of my products. Who cares about distributing content? And, and the key points of exclusivity are at the bottom of the page and mostly not read. They're buried in the bullet points. Now, here's the cool thing. This is what I like about being at Mac. This is what I like about research. Because I can have that theory, but it doesn't mean it's right. In the end, what I think doesn't matter. What the customer thinks matters. Company logic doesn't matter. Customer logic matters. So we have a theory. We generate a hypothesis. Our hypothesis is there's a better way to communicate the appeal and the exclusivity, and we form a hypothesis about what that way is. By the way, that's an important point. Value negative. Does anybody want to order now? I don't want to order now. What I want to get is more traffic now. A button is an example of a process level value proposition. And here's an example of a, of, a, of a poor button. A poor button might say click here. That's a zero value. Okay? A, a value negative button, I'll show you, it might be uh, register. How many of you wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to register for something? <laughs> the worst of all the value negative buttons I've seen so far is submit. Submit! Fall on your knees before the lords of marketing and admit that we've defeated you. Who wants to submit, especially to some commercial enterprise? No. A value positive button might be get instant access now. Do you see how we're intensifying the value at the decision point? Right down to a tiny micro guess whether to click or not. This page has many micro guesses. We're trying to get each of them right. So here's what we do. This is the new page. And get more readers as early as tomorrow. Can you see the intensification of appeal? And, and imagery is used to support the claim. Do you see how now we're providing an evidential for the claim at the top of the page? And look down here at the, at the very specific results. Gain up to 14% more views of your content. Boom, 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 boom. And exclusivity is being communicated. And the size and look at the unparalleled network of 1,000 plus websites and search engines. And they, they focus on this piece. You might have something to say about that. But... What does the customer say in the end? 
By the way, that's better than the order now, and it could be strengthened still. All of this is a process. It's not an event. Optimization is an ongoing process. There are many versions of this page, but let's look at the result. There's the original. There's the optimized. Here's what customers say. 321% more respond. Do you see how ratcheting up appeal and exclusivity is impacting the offer? All right? Same thing in your own life. The same thing in your own life. The more appeal and the more exclusivity, even as you work inside of a company, the more exclusivity you can bring to that company, the more they need you, which impacts whether they lay you off or whether they promote you and, whether, and how much they pay you. Exclusivity is your key inside of that organization. Let's keep going. One might argue, if you look back to the study we saw at the beginning, the one that the girl Nicole's page, one might argue this page has appeal and it has exclusivity. But does it? What's going on? Why is it still underperforming? I'm near the end, guys. Are you okay? Am I wearing you out? You sure? All right. If I get boring, this guy can talk to you about War and Peace. He just read it last night. <laughs> I'll just sit down and listen. We'll all enjoy him. Um, so, so, I was interviewed in the Washington Post. And the Post is asking me this question. What can Obama or Romney do to intensify their personal value proposition? They'd been reading my work and asked this question. And I'm being interviewed in there. And the problem was... The men made many claims of appeal and exclusivity, didn't they? Only I can do this. The other guy can't. I bring to this job this power, and the other guy can't. They said all of those things, but how many people actually believe them? And you can say, well, some believed Obama. Not a lot more than believed Romney, if you think about it. Neither one got really high rankings here. And the question is, why? And these are quotes, for, these are from my interview. I said, the predisposition now is to doubt every claim. That's true whether you're selling soap or hope. And the reality is, right now, we're all jaded by what we're seeing in the marketplace, whether it's marketing or politics. So where does that leave us? Well, to the most important of the two dyads, final part of what I'm teaching. Before your message matters, two things have to happen. You can figure out this logically. I have to understand it and I have to believe it. If I don't understand it, and I don't believe it, appeal and exclusivity don't matter because I don't believe what you're saying. And that is at the heart, it's called the communication dyad, and that dyad is essential, and yet it's missed by every site I look at. Let's go back. Searching for the mass accurate mailing list, your hunt is over. How strong a headline is that? Let me tell you how to test a headline. Just bring it back into a real relationship. Back to Alexis at the bar, searching for the most eligible bachelor, your hunt is over. <laughs> How do you think that's going to work? Not too good, right? Because the tone undermines the credibility of the claim. Do you understand that? And then what is this? Get 500 free leads today, and then underneath it in italics and in red with qualifying purchase. What do you think that says to somebody? Oh, uh, there's a catch. And and in the end, look at this next thing. To receive your 500 free leads, fill out and submit the form below. Once received, you'll be contacted by one of our business consultants. The company thinks that's what they're saying, but here's what the customer's hearing. Give us that information, and our salespeople are gonna spam you for the rest of their lives. <laughs> we're gonna call you, we're gonna send you emails, and we're gonna annoy you. Now, why couldn't the company see that? Because company logic, because of self-interest. I can tell you how this happens. Somebody sits there and says, we're not getting enough leads. And we gotta get leads, I just got called in by my boss. And somebody else says, well, why don't we try an incentive? And somebody else at the table says, we don't have any more budget. Says, so the genius at the table says, I know, we could give them 500 free leads. And the other guy says, we can't do that. He says, we can give it to them with a purchase. And voila, they have a, they have a plan. But it's a weak, inefficient way to convince anybody that it's worth anything. So, so we have to address all of these problems. Even this sequence on the right is really important stuff, but it's not there. Final point. So if they have appeal, let's just take it at face value. Was there appeal there? I'm not saying it was good, but they had appeal. Was there some exclusivity? Yeah, they claimed the most accurate mailing list failed. But those points have to be multiplied by the points below. And when you multiply that, 
Is there some clarity? I'd say give it a two. Is there any credibility? I'd say give it to zero. And when we multiply zero times five, what do we get? Zero. zero. And that's precisely what happened in this particular page. So how do we account for this? Spec we, we, we use specification, very specific language. Quantification, we never make a qualitative claim about ourselves. We let somebody else make that. Back to Alexis. Alexis, if I wanted to say something qualitative about myself, I'd get somebody else to say it. What do we call that, guys, when we have a guy help us? Wingman. A wingman. wingman. Back to Mark, who's expert in this subject. <laughs> I know his next book. A wingman. What does a wingman do? He says the things I can't say without looking like I'm a tool. Right? So, same thing here. I can't make those claims. That's what verification is. Somebody else says it. And three ways to achieve clarity. We simplify, we layer, and we sequence. I'd love to talk more about that, but the same thing applies to your life. The same thing. And, and I, I should go back to it in a moment, but only look at this page, and you'll see that in the optimized version, we, use, we make 26 million phone calls a year to ensure you get the most accurate mailing list available. Do you see how 26 million calls a year starts to add quantification and specificity. It says, trusted since 1972. Isn't that better than saying in business since 1972? And it implies we've been doing this a long time. We're not one of those fly-by-night operations going to sell you a list that's no good. And then what's next? A list of exactly how much? 210 million users, consumers, 14 million U.S. businesses, 13 million executives. See, see how the exact size of the list now is being communicated to you? And then there's an interesting point down here. Our tele-research associate makes over 80,000 calls a day. Do you know how we figured that number out? With a calculator. We said, wait a second, if you're doing 26 million a year, then that means you'd have to be doing this many calls a day. Is this true? Operations came back, verified the number was 80,000, and we suddenly had a strong evidential to support the claim at the top. What did that do? Well, all of this, look on the right-hand side. Do you see our wingmen? Those are testimonials. See them right there, all down the side about the accuracy of the list. See the vertical flow to keep it into the thought sequence so that's a clear series of micro yeses without confusion. What's the result of this? Original optimized, 201% increase. But that's not all, because we learn the value proposition and exactly how to say it. What did it really produce? This. All over the business. Those are all other business units. Massive lifts everywhere. Huge revenue and a career change for this young lady. Why, why these numbers? Because more people said yes. Now look guys, what you write down on that piece of paper, first of all, has to be clear. Some, some, some sort of uh, vague language about bringing joy into the world isn't clear. And what you say in that piece of paper has to be credible. There has to be something. Your credibility grows out of who you are. Do you hear me? It's the being that supports the doing. It's essential philosophy. Your predicate is, is driven by your subject, and all of existence is just subject and predicate. Fundamental unit, I am, yes? Sorry. Three ways to increase clarity. Uh, specific, this all the way back up here? Yes. Your answer on that piece of paper needs to be credible, and the credibility comes, for instance, when, when, when someone, when Pro Professor Theo Harris talks about what he does, I asked him a question, we were talking about it on the break, the first time I met him, at a lunch, essentially what his own value, I didn't use those words, but I asked him the question, he was saying, he sees why I asked the question now, but his answer was credible, because of who he is and his life experience, it made sense. You have got to be very careful that your answer doesn't have a level of credibility. Because if it's not believed, it's not there at all. It, it's multiplied by zero. Same thing goes for the clarity. Man, I struggled with this. It was hard to talk about what I did. My life was complex. But simplifying it to the point where I could say it right brings satisfaction in my choice of life and peace regardless of what's going on around me. Enormous peace. I don't like, I'll give you an example how that works. I walk into this lecture to speak, and I, I, I don't come into a lecture with nervousness. You know why? Because I found that nervousness means I'm thinking about myself instead of thinking about my audience. As soon as I put my attention on the audience and how they're receiving this, then instead of thinking how, how I'm performing, everything in me shifts. 
Every time I teach, my father was a great teacher, still is. He's a scholar. And he, he really taught me this many years ago. And he told me a story. I was getting ready to speak. I was young. I was getting ready to speak, and he told me a story where he was in a meeting. And you know, my, my dad was a pastor. I told you that, and I'm conservative. And there was a, there was a young man getting ready to speak, preach in the pulpit, and there was another man beside him, an old man. And the young man was sitting up there nervous, and he turned to the old man, looking for encouragement, and he said to him, an old pastor, he said, well, I, I'm just nervous. This is one of my first times, and it's a huge crowd. Any advice you can give me? And the old man said something that almost sounds rude. He said, son, you're thinking about yourself too much. Get your attention off yourself and get your attention on the people you're here to serve, and you won't have time to be nervous. You'll be focused on them. Now, that is exactly what I'm talking about, articulated in just a real life example. And so, when I come here, I don't judge, even if somebody says to me, if, the, if my feedback is really high, but I don't feel like I communicated something that actually served and helped the people, I don't feel good. And if my feedback is low, but I could see the right people connecting, it's like, okay, I'm satisfied. In the end, you gotta figure out how you're gonna measure your life. And once you have your value proposition, you can start measuring your life for whether or not you're actually communicating, living, predicating into this world something worthwhile. So, I believe that, I love, by the way, I love this. This was a Roman leader who was one of the great leaders in Rome. And all of my children have read his work multiple times. He was a stoic at heart, very consistent with his life. Remember what pulls the strings is the force hidden within. There lies the power to persuade, and there the life. He said that, and he lived it as a great emperor in the Roman Empire. And uh, I stop now.